Daniel Inkstein. Do take Melissa Renee Warren. Do take Melissa Renee Warren. To be my lawfully wedded wife. To be my wa lawfully. <laughs> and pancakey. <laughs> yeah. I've been scared of this all my life. <laughs> I, I love that the, uh, that the pastor tried to fix it by going all the way back to the beginning and, and through whatever, whatever his name was. <laughs> so marriages, uh, weddings can be fun. Marriages can be fun too, but weddings can be a lot of fun. We thought we'd tell you a little bit. I, some people talk about weddings today for some reason. I don't know. But um, the, their, their, uh, uh, our wedding was kind of fun. No, it was a ton of fun. Uh, first of all, when, uh, uh, we got, when we got married, and our, we're doing, celebrating our 41st wedding anniversary, but first of all, I was pastor of a small country church about 150 miles from where Marcy's dad was pastor in Memphis, and we got married in Memphis. And I didn't think anybody was coming from the, the church, but they chartered a bus and so just about the time for the ceremony to start, this big Greyhound bus pulled into the parking lot of this church, you know, and all these people unloaded. And our marriage was what we call a double knot. So Marcy, tell them about why it's a, a double knot. Well, both of our dads were pastors. And, uh, Do you tell your wife to hold the mic closer? Is that okay? <laughs> and so at our wedding, my dad walked me down the aisle and then his dad was up on the stage and he did the beginning remarks. And then my dad stepped up to do the I do's and his dad stepped down as the best man. And um, so we were double knotted. So I think that's one reason that June will be 41 years. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then uh, everything, when the marriage ceremony was finished, you know, we had a nice time with our friends and with our guests. and. And, and uh, by the way, this, it was a very inexpensive wedding. We picked flowers and borrowed suits and dresses and stuff. And a $250. Friend, $250, total yeah. wedding. Friend made the wedding cake. Uh, so I guess those days are gone, but that's, that, was, uh, that was fun about it. So it's time to go, and they've got the car all decorated, you know. So we get in the car, and there's a long driveway of the church, and it's got the tin cans and all that. We get all the way to the end of the driveway, and there was this little kid. He was about 10, little boy that hung around the house that I was living in. Marcy's moving into this house. So this kid's from, from where I lived and a, a good friend and he just kind of hung around all the time. So we get all the way to the end of the driveway on the way to our long, honeymoon. Long driveway. Long driveway and Henry pops up in the back seat. <laughs> so they had put him in the back seat. He said, hi Barry. <laughs> we backed all the way back down the driveway and unloaded Henry. And then went on our, on our way. So marriages, marriage, weddings are a lot of fun. And we've had a lot of them. I remember one in particular where um, we were in a home. And you know those old movie cameras that you had this bar? You know, it makes a noise. It goes, Rrr. and then it has this bar that's got four floodlights on it. So as we're walking in, the entrance is like through the back door and through the kitchen. That was the, that was the, the, the uh, walking down the aisle part, you know. So we're, we're going through the back door and through the kitchen, and they've got this, this bar with those four floodlights right in my face, and they're backing up right in front of me. And in addition to that, there was a chihuahua barking, and, and he had a hold of my pants leg, and just all the way in there, you know. <laughs> so we've had some, we've had some fun in, in uh, marriages. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that couple that we looked at, I think they probably are a pretty happy couple. They seem to have a lot of joy uh, in their marriage, at least... At least I hope to. I hope so. And you know, I think that uh, the world would like us to, to think that happy marriages are a thing of the past. 
The world would like us to think that happy marriages don't exist anymore. In fact, if you look at TV shows, primetime TV shows today, very, very few happy marriages are portrayed. And if there, if there is a, a husband in the home, if there's a man in the home, he's almost always portrayed in a negative light. So what we want to do today is uh, just to, to say that marriages can be happy. And you may wonder if a happy marriage is even possible, but it is. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 9, Enjoy life with the love uh, wife. Let me start over. Ecclesiastes 9 9 says, Enjoy life with the wife you love all the days of your fleeting life. Enjoy your life with the wife you love all the days of your fleeting life. And I think the Bible is saying, Enjoy your marriage and enjoy your spouse. God is saying, Life is short. Enjoy your marriage, those of you that are, that are married. So we have some tips, and we're kind of thinking of these tips as uh, gifts today. So we have some tips for those, uh, for those of you who are in a relationship. And these tips are not just for marriages, but they are tips also for um, any relationship that you're in. Well, the first tip we'd like to provide is stay close. That means you hold hands and you hug you have affection for each other. And guys, it's really important to the women in our relationships that we show our affection, even in those moments when we're not moving in the direction of uh, sexual intention. Share your feelings. This is kind of hard for us as guys. Talk about the day and talk about the challenges of the day. So uh, one day this week, I had several challenges, nothing really bad, but uh, you know, Marcy asked me, okay, uh, how is your day? And I'm thinking of confidentiality, and I'm thinking of, I don't want to put burdens on her. She's had a good day. And, and I'm thinking all this stuff is just rolling through my mind. And I wondered about that. You know, what would she think if I'm hesitant about sharing my day? She wouldn't be thinking about those things. She'd be thinking about, well, why isn't he close enough to me to want to share with me? So guys, we have to discipline ourselves to really open up and share what's going on and, and uh, talk to our wives. So stay close is an important, uh, an important gift for your relationship. I think I'm going to do the next one too. i got to get, it, get your next gift out of, this, uh, out of this cool box. This one is listen. Uh, and I'm especially addressing the guys. Guys, what this means is putting away the distractions. And that's your cell phone. That's turning off the TV. Now you may say, no, pastor, you don't understand. I can multitask. I can listen to my wife and stay on my phone or watch TV or whatever. But you know, that's not what it's about. I'm not talking about whether you're capable of listening and doing something else. I'm saying that your wife really enjoys what's called face-to-face -face interactions. Now guys, we like shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder interactions. That's the way we enjoy communicating. They did a survey, they did a test with some little boys and teenage boys and grown men and little girls and teenage girls and grown girls. They put them in a room and asked them just to communicate. And what happened was, even the little girls and the teenage girls, they immediately went face to face and talked to each other. But in every generation, the guys, without any instruction or, or tips, they sat shoulder to shoulder, side by side, and that's the way they communicated. So guys, remember, if you're gonna listen to your wife, uh, the wives, your women in your life, need that face-to-face -face interaction. Now, women, sometimes we guys need a, a, a bottom line of where the story is going. <laughs> sometimes. Now, we're, we're willing to listen to the whole thing. Guys, we're going to listen to the whole thing. But sometimes you need to tell us, you know. The car's the, okay. The car's okay. <laughs> and, and then go on and we'll listen to the whole story, you know. Okay. And remember that. Re remember that. Um, uh, sometimes we, need, we just need to have that kind of information uh, up, up front. And also, women, remember that uh, when you ask us, we're talking about listening and communicating with each other. When you ask us, like you're just sitting there, you know, you're just maybe watching TV or nothing going on or watching the sunset, and you say, uh, and wife, you say, sweetheart, what are you thinking about right now? It is entirely possible that when your husband says, nothing. It's entirely possible that that's true. Uh, 
You know, there's a book out, Bill and Pam Farrell wrote this book, it's called uh, Wa uh, spaghetti, uh, Waffles and Spaghetti, and the point of it is that women are like spaghetti, everything kind of interconnects, and men are like waffles. We kind of deal with things one at a time, and so we deal with life in boxes, you know, one box at a time. And remember, it is entirely possible that that box is empty and that we really are, uh, we really are thinking about, uh, about nothing. All right, let me grab our next uh, gift, and Marcy is going to give you a give you a tip about, about dating, a gift here. So I know some of you are thinking, yeah, but you're married to the preacher. You don't know the person I'm married to. It's a whole different story. But just set that aside. These are good principles for anybody. Um, on keep dating, do you remember when you first saw the person that you married and how you felt and how you wanted to look and how you wanted to get their attention, and you probably took two showers and fixed your hair, and I know some of you are saying, well, I don't have hair anymore, but um, I, I started to do this one with just start with bathe, but um, do that, <laughs> and if somebody's on the other side of the room, there may be a reason for that, so uh, start with just uh, being clean and taking care of yourself and being the best you that you can be so that you can be attractive to your spouse because that's what you want them to be attracted to you instead of somebody else. Um, do you remember back, guys, when you would plan out a date with this woman and, you know, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? I'm going to make this extra special. Um, and you'd look forward to that time that you're going to spend together that may have been what you did a long, long time ago, but don't stop because that's the same person and you love them and you want to have that time and that special time with them. So be the best you can be and plan and set a time aside that you can spend time together. Um, and think about what would she really enjoy doing or what would he really enjoy doing? And sometimes you get in a rut of... Uh, doing things neither of you really enjoy, or just what one person likes, and you get in a rut, and, and okay, um, let's go out to eat, and let's watch TV, and you don't do some of those exciting things that you used to do when you were younger, and places you'd go, and adventures you would do, but think about what they would enjoy, and uh, if you have different interest and some different things that you would enjoy doing, try alternating and doing something that the husband would enjoy doing and then something that the wife would enjoy doing and just get the joy of seeing them enjoy something that you do together. Our next gift is called loyalty and I'm going to kind of go first on this one. But in, when we talk about loyalty, guys, uh, especially men in, in the group, uh, and I'm kind of addressing especially the men, when we think about loyalty, I think one of the things we need to do is to really demonstrate with our lives, with our actions, really show our wives that we are indeed loyal to them. And sometimes that's hard because men are uh, very visually oriented. We're oriented toward visual, uh, visual stimulation in every area of our lives. But guys, you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about looking at other women. And you know, Job said, I'm going to make a covenant with my eyes. As, and when you're in the presence of your wife especially, just out of respect for your wife, just be in control of that aspect of your lives is who you look at and how you look at them. It's really important. In thinking about this loyalty, I, I ask our daughter Katie because she's around us a lot and she observes us a lot and has all of her life. So I ask her, what are some things that you see about us that you might not see in some other couples? And she said, well, two things stand out uh, as the main things. One is that... Um, you always have each other's back. And no matter uh, if it's with the kids or with someone or a family member or whoever it is, you all always have each other's back and take up for each other. And um, um, then another that she noticed was that we're never alone with somebody else. And uh, if you know us, you know that's the case that we've just made this covenant with each other that we are not going to be alone with somebody of the opposite sex um, in 
if there's a counseling situation, either the doors open or uh, staff is around or I go in with him on those counseling, uh, but we never take time. If there's, uh, we don't give somebody a ride home, anything that would give an opportunity for a temptation or uh, for someone to be able to say something. I think if you heard that one of us was having an affair, you would probably say, I know that's not true because I know that they are never alone with anybody, so that wouldn't be a possibility. But, um, and uh, another thing is um, in the Bible when it's talking about leaving and cleaving, and uh, your spouse should be that most important person in your life, and they should get number one top priority in the relationship. And I know that uh, when we first married, uh, Barry spoke with my mother-in-law, and he's saying, you know, there's going to be some times when Marcy's going to choose to go to her family for Thanksgiving or for Christmas, and we're going to do whatever uh, Marcy chooses for that year. A lot of pressure. <laughs> but she said, that's okay. I'm just going to make her love me so much that she'll want to come here every time. <laughs> So another thing about loyalty that's kind of important is in the area of loyalty, uh, guys, tell your wife, tell your wife, uh, and, and maybe this, this needs to happen kind of, you know, I was going to say often, uh, but at least routinely, you know, tell your wife, I really appreciate all you do. In many cases, you're talking about a wife that is uh, working outside the home and doing a bunch of stuff in the home. And I, I, I tell it this way, sweetheart, I couldn't do your job. I really appreciate all that you do in our home. Thank you for all you do in our home. And women, if you could say with authenticity to your husband, even if both are working, this is an important message to communicate. Sweetheart, I really respect you for all that you do around our home. And respect is important for guys. And so to say to them, I really respect you for what you're doing around our home. In fact, and, and I think it's, this is valid to say for, about your husband, because it's probably true. If you think there's any way this is true, you need to say it once in a while. I know that you would die for our family. Men are willing to die to protect their families. I know that you would die for our family, and I respect you for that, and thank you for the way that you stand for our family. I think all that's a part of loyalty. Marcy's going to talk about how we can be best friends in our relationship. If you were going to go on a trip, say you won a fabulous trip somewhere, anywhere you wanted to go, and someone said, okay, you get to pick out one person to take with you. And I want you to think for just a minute, who would you pick to take with you on that trip? I hope it was your spouse. <laughs> um, you may have a very close girlfriend or, or a guy friend that you'd want to go on a trip with, and that, that's okay. But your number one should be your best friend and, and you're thinking about, oh wow, if I could go anywhere, that's who I'd wanna be. And um, a lot of times we get into habits of griping and complaining and just not being fun to be around. And uh, that might not be the person that you would pick out to take with you. If you wanted to take somebody on a trip with you, who would it be? Is it somebody that you can just let down your guard, you can totally be yourself with, you don't have to put on any pretense, you don't have to walk on eggshells and worry about what you're going to say and what you're going to do, but this would be the person that is your best friend that you could take with you on that trip and just enjoy talking and being together. Um, and don't allow any person other than your spouse to be that very best friend especially no one of the opposite sex. This, um, if you're confiding in someone and, and there's a, an emotional attachment there, uh, that can grow stronger and it can lead to an affair and a, a closeness and that's just very, very dangerous. And um, men can have men friends and women can have women friends, but don't let that best friend that closest. Uh, but if you were to ask this question, who do you want your spouse's best friend to be? And then be that friend. Yeah. This one is huge. Let it go, let it go, let it go. And I'm not going to sing the song. I know many of you have heard that. Uh, but I want you to think back um, to all the things that have happened. And 
be willing to let those go. Now, I'm not saying if you are currently in a situation where you're being abused and, and uh, somebody is uh, openly having an affair and, and all these things are going on right now and you say, oh, that's okay, you know, I, I forgive you and uh, let's just keep going. It's, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about things that have happened in the past that you have truly repented of and asked for forgiveness and given that to the Lord and worked through that together and uh, you're moving forward, don't bring up all the past garbage in every argument that you have because that's not the time or place. And, and garbage can pile up and uh, all the um, things like flirting and insults and blow-ups and anger and all that stuff. And if you bring it up in every fight, that's not, not healthy. Um, but if you could picture that that relationship and you have all that, you're trying to swim upriver, and you're just trying and trying, and you just can't get anywhere, and you're being pulled back, and, and you just can't move forward, and you turn around, and you see that there is a rope attached to you, and at the end of that rope is a large barge, and it's just covered up with garbage, all this garbage of all the years of all the wrongs that have been done to you by your spouse. And you're trying to move forward, and you're trying to have a good relationship, but it's just not working because all that garbage keeps coming up every time. If you can take that knife of forgiveness and cut that rope and let go, the relief and the freedom that comes by just letting all of that go and let that float on down the river. And um, don't let these things hold you back. Let it go. Yeah, good word. What we're saying is value your marriage partner. Uh, value the other person in that relationship. It's hold them in high esteem. One of the things that we always enjoy doing, and we do this often, is to say, uh, sweetheart, not only do I love you, but I like you. To tell the person, I enjoy hanging around with you, uh, yeah, I love you, but there's something else going on here, and that something else is that I like you. Try to encourage your partner and believe in them and praise them. Value their opinion. How long has it been since you said, hey, I need you to help me think something through, and then just describe a situation? Because you know what that says? That says, I really respect you, and I really appreciate your input. I, I, I value it. I hold your input in high esteem. It's an expression of value. And, and uh, we, we kind of picked up this phrase called say it, mean it, and what, that, what we mean by that, say it, mean it, is try to find one thing a day, one thing a day that you can compliment your spouse. That's a part of valuing and holding your uh, partner in, in high esteem. To once a day, find an authentic way that you can compliment your spouse. What a huge thing that is to communicate your value. So we're going to jump into the Word. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you, sweetheart, for helping us out today. And uh, appreciate your um, comments on marriage. So our theme for this month of May is hope for your marriage. And we're looking at couples in the Bible. Some of them are good and some of them are bad. Some are positive influences, positive examples. Some are negative examples. And today we're going to look at what might be the most famous couple in history. Want to take a guess? you got a listening guide, so I guess it's not fair. Yeah, it's Adam and Eve, yeah. I think Adam and Eve might be the famous. Well, maybe the, that couple that got married last weekend. But Adam and Eve are pretty famous. And we're going to read from Genesis chapter 2. And this is a story in which uh, the Bible tells about the, uh, Adam and Eve and how they uh, came together. Look at verse 18. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper as his complement. So the Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky and brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found as his complement. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. So God took one of his ribs, and he closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman, and brought her to the man, and the man said, This one, at last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman because she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife. They become one flesh. 
Both the man and his wife were naked, not clothed, and yet they were not ashamed. So it's interesting that in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, God creates light, and he says, that's good. He creates the sun and the moon and the dry land and the sea and the vegetation. He does all of his creation, and several times in that process, he looks at it, and he says, that's good. And one time he even looked at his creation, and he said, it's very good. But then in Genesis chapter 2, God says, it's not good. Well, what's not good? He said, it's not good for the man to be alone. And so he says, I'll make a helper as his complement. You know, in verses 19 and 20, there's something that I have missed sometimes as I studied in Genesis chapter 2. In fact, I really, tell you the truth, I missed this for years. And it's that piece where Adam names all these creatures, and it's before Eve is created. Why do you think that God had Adam go through that exercise? And think about this. That took a long time. You know, have you pictured maybe in your mind a parade of animals going by and Adam says, okay, that's a giraffe. That's a, and I know, and no, I'm not talking, I'm not saying he spoke English, but in, in, our, in our language, you know, he, he named these guys. Well, I don't think so. I think Adam is really, really smart. Way smarter than we give him credit for. And I think he's got his scientific mind. I think there's a lot of study and analysis that goes into naming these animals. Why would God put him through that exercise? Do you think that God really thought, well, maybe one of these animals would be right for Adam? No, of course not. God knew all along what he's going to do, didn't he? But what's it for? It's for Adam to understand, for Adam to realize how significant the creation of this woman was. Adam needed to learn how awesome and how wonderful Eve would be. So the first lesson about marriage for, from Adam and Eve is this. Marriage is a fulfillment of God's plan. Now Paul makes it clear that being single is okay. And the New Testament makes it really clear that it's okay to be single. That's not what this is about. But it is about marriage and what our society, how our society views marriage. I read some interesting statistics this week. When I was a kid... 78% of the households in America were made up of married people. Today, 48%. What is to account for the huge drop in uh, households? Well, there are several factors there. People get married uh, at an older age, and that's all fine and healthy and good. But one of the factors that we simply can't ignore is the factor of people living together without marriage has increased a thousand percent since I was uh, since I was a kid so the Bible makes it really clear that God's plan is for a husband and wife to come together a man and a woman a male and a female come together and to bond as husband and wife in fact he says they become one person the second lesson is that healthy marriage is an adventure can you imagine the adventure for Adam and Eve wow what an amazing adventure they embarked on so many discoveries so many new things to learn, so much to pass on to their children. It was an incredible adventure. And life today is filled with routine, isn't it? Life is filled with the routine things of uh, providing for just food and shelter for our families is a huge routine. The routines of work and school and church. Life is filled with things that can become mundane and even boring soccer practice and meals and laundry and it never ends and it keeps coming day after day after day these things are essential but our lives as a married couple do not have to be boring or in a rut dream together <clears throat> set goals together be willing to step out in faith put God first in your relationship and it'll be an adventure do something that is completely for others. Some of the greatest adventures in life are when we just simply say, wow, this is not for me. I want to do something that's not going to benefit me in any way. It's completely for others. One of the most memorable trips that Marcy and I have ever taken was when one of our trips to Moldova. <clears throat> and in that trip to Moldova, Marcy had the opportunity to talk about special needs and to train 
200 pastors and special needs. It's kind of cool because they have a northern piece and a southern piece and they kind of don't get along. So they had 100 pastors from the north and 100 pastors from the south and they speak different languages. So this thing is translated by two different translators and she's speaking to 200 guys and my job was basically to carry her bags. That was pretty much what, uh, what I was doing. We got there and they'd prepared a special room just for us. It was the best that they had to offer at this camp. And in the middle of the room, there was a, a what's that that goes under the mattress? A, a box spring is what I would call it. You know, that foundation thing. And it had three or four quilts on it, but it was just the wood of that. And that was the bed that we slept on that week. And, and it was okay until in the night, every night, there was some kind of critter that was, you know how they kind of try to dig through the wood? Man, he was clawing on that wood. I'm watching to see where he's going to come through into the room. There wasn't a lot of sleep going on. But you know, I look back at that as one of the most meaningful trip kind of experiences, mission kind of experiences of my life, because it was an adventure because it was all about other people. It was all about helping them. When you put God first and you do something that is selfless, it's a great adventure. So I, I would encourage you to make your marriage a great adventure. The third lesson about marriage from Adam and Eve is that a healthy marriage is a partnership. In verse 18, God said, I'm going to make a helper who is a companion. In verse 23, Adam looks at her and he says, at last, she's bone of my bone. She is flesh of my flesh. Facing life challenges and life's joys side by side, hand in hand with someone that you love. For us, for Marcy and I, it's a long walk in the neighborhood, or maybe it's a hike to a beautiful waterfall. During those times we walk together, we dream together, we plan together. And I'll tell you a secret. We even do a little bit of message preparation together. It kind of goes like this. I'll think and pray and read about what I believe God's leading me to say. And then I'll say, Marcy, what do you think about this? And we'll talk it through. And that kind of a partnership. Marriage is a partnership. And in a healthy marriage where you respect each other, you've got to have a healthy um, a partnership with your marriage. The fourth lesson from Adam and Eve is that healthy marriage is a, is a relationship. And let me tell you what kind of a relationship Adam and Eve is described for them. The Bible says, here's what's going to happen, Adam. You're going to leave your father and mother. Okay, I know he didn't have a father and mother, but he's talking about, in general, what happens with guys. And Jesus quoted this, and so did Paul. So they're all stating, here's what happens in a healthy marriage. Guy, you, man, you leave your father and mother, and you are bonded to your wife. Sometimes it's translated cleave to your wife. Sometimes it's translated cling to your wife. But you know what it really means? It means glued together. You know, in a marriage, that's, what's that's what happens. You can't take a marriage apart without pulling away a part of the other person. And I know there are biblical grounds for divorce. I'm not saying that should never happen. But I am saying that a healthy marriage is a relationship in which you're bonded, you're glued together. You become one person, and that's a permanent relationship. It's a relationship of oneness. And when I say a relationship of oneness, I'm not just talking about the physical uh, intimacy part of the relationship. It's a relationship of oneness in so many other ways. And interesting, the Bible says in verse 25 that Adam and Eve were not ashamed. Not ashamed. Why would it tell us that? Isn't that an interesting little tidbit? They're not ashamed. What is it that makes us ashamed? You see, shame comes when sin enters into our lives. And sin means we're trying to hit the mark. We're doing the best we can to hit the target of being righteous and being good, but we miss the mark. Sin means to miss the mark. Or sin means God draws a line and says, don't, don't cross this line. It's going to be really bad for you if you cross this line. Don't do this thing I've told you not to do. Don't eat the fruit of that tree that I told you not to eat of. Don't be uh, getting involved physically or emotionally with someone other than your spouse that's of the opposite sex. Don't cross that line, God says. Enjoy all of your life with the wife that you love, God says. Don't cross that line of immorality. Sin is when we step across that line in open rebellion against God. So when sin enters a relationship or enters a life, the next thing that happens is shame. We're ashamed of ourselves. We want to cover ourselves up. We want to hide ourselves. So sin leads to shame and sin leads to fear. The Bible says that Adam and Eve were afraid the next time they appeared before God. And sin leads to hiding from God. That's what Adam and Eve did. They were ashamed and they were afraid 
and then they hid from God. You see, sin not only steals the happiness from your marriage relationship, sin steals the happiness from your life. So just for a moment, just forget about marriage and let's just talk about the impact of sin. You see, in your life, sin makes you ashamed. In your life, sin makes you afraid of your relationship with God. And in your life, sin makes you hide from God when God wants to be close to you. And so that's why God has sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to live a sinless life and die on the cross, die a horrible death for us. When Jesus died, He did not deserve to die, but He was dying to pay the debt for our sins. So you see, when sin impacts us and makes us ashamed, when sin makes us afraid, or when sin makes us hide from God, the remedy, the solution, the answer that God has provided is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a relationship in which we come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I know that you never sinned, but you died in my place. Would you please forgive my sin? And would you please Let me be close to God again. Allow me to be close to God again. You see, forgiveness heals the broken relationship between you and God. Sin causes shame and separation and hiding and fear. But the forgiveness that God offers us brings us back together with God and we're close to Him again. The so what of today's message is that sin hurts you, but forgiveness through Jesus heals you. Sin hurts you. It destroys. It separates you from God. But forgiveness through Jesus heals the broken relationship between you and God. If you'd like to pray with someone about that relationship between you and God or about your marriage relationship, if you'd like to talk with someone, a team will be under the word prayer. You can go to one of them and say, I just need to pray with someone about my relationship with God. And I think a couple of people will also be on this side. And the way we do the closing of our services We want you to respond to what the Holy Spirit might be saying to you, drawing the way the Holy Spirit might be drawing you. But we recognize that some of you might be a little shy about coming to the front of the auditorium during the song. If you want to do that, we welcome you doing that. But if you feel more comfortable waiting till after the song, the main thing is that you go and talk with someone. You go and pray with someone. So either during this song or after this song, if the Holy Spirit is leading you to get closer to God right now, We invite you to do that and and have a conversation with someone who's trained and ready to pray with you about that. That's a powerful moment, and we invite you to come and receive Christ and His forgiveness today. Let's pray.